I'm pleased. Oh. I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Sherry Wells Jensen, who's an associate professor in the Department of English and co-director of the English for Speakers, Speakers of Other Languages program at Bowling Green State University. Uh, Dr. Wells Jensen coordinates uh, her university's minor in linguistics. Uh, she's a linguist whose research interests are in a number of areas that are uh, somewhat traditional, uh, psycholinguistics, for instance, errors in speech, uh, language preservation, braille, phonetics, uh, but also a subspecialty that's really not that well represented among linguists, xenolinguistics. Uh, in fact, I remember uh, the, the first time I came across her work, um, if you go to her website and click on the link to her xenolinguistics page, uh, you'll see uh, materials, syllabus and other materials for a course that she taught uh, in extraterrestrial linguistics. Um, uh, one of the things that's uh, encouraging about it is uh, it includes languages uh, such as Vulcan. Uh, it included uh, guest speakers uh, like the translator of Klingon Hamlet. Uh, and, uh, and so today we're going to learn about um, how to think about uh, the relevance of linguistics for understanding extraterrestrials. Uh, Dr. Wells Johnson. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for driving here. He's gonna flick my slide buttons for me, I appreciate that. And I knew, and I sort of, I sort of felt like I should apologize for the Klingon and the Vulcan, um, because I knew that if I didn't do that in the class, the, the students would skin me alive. Like, how can we, we have to have some Klingon and some Vulcan, and it was, it was in fact super fun. And we did manage to get some real linguistic um, facts out of them, they are, they are carefully constructed you know, constructed languages, so it was worth doing, and, uh, and they didn't skin me for it, so I'm happy about that. Um, what I want to talk about is what linguistic science really has to say about what language is, how likely language is, and how learnable it is, where language comes from, and all that kind of good stuff. So um, the, 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 the first thing I want to ask, the, the first question that we really have to ask is why is there language in the first place? And this, if you want to have a fight with a linguist, you should start by asking this question, because we really enjoy going after each other on this question, um, and we all think we know the answer. But if I'm looking at empirical data, I have to confess that I don't know the answer. Um, so here are the hypotheses that have come up in, in linguistics, and these are always framed um, with the, I, with the main question is, well, where did it come from and how much of it is innate? And that's, just say the word innate, and you'll get linguists all riled up. So the first possibility is that it was physiological, some kind of physiological a mutation, maybe about 150,000 years ago, um, that created a specialized grammar module in the human brain that's neurologically based. It's um, self-contained. You don't need uh, your, the rest of your cognitive abilities to speak languages. Um, and the existence of this module is what makes language possible so that kids, little babies come into the world ready to know that there are nouns, ready to know that there are verbs, and ready to know that you can predicate, that you can say things about nouns and verbs. And it, this is supposed to save them a whole lot of time in learning languages so that they don't have to figure out nounness as, a, as an 18 month old. They just have that bang, they just kind of know. Okay, I get that, I get that. I've got these. Um, I, sort of ironically in our context, it's called universal grammar. Maybe they should have made it more terrestrial, I don't know. Um, but uh, so the, the idea is that as soon as you're born, you've got all this linguistic um, background onloaded and you're ready to go. So you don't have to figure out there is language, you know that already. So the second possibility is that there is no built-in grammar module. We just have all of these cognitive resources at our disposal. So we can make, we can hypothesis test, we can do pattern matching, and we have a pro-social desire to communicate, and we have a theory of mind. So we want to talk to each other, and we, we understand that maybe there's a mind over there that, that is sort of like ours, so that we could get a response. So the specifics of language structure then are not built into your genes or built into your neurons. They are filtered through your embodied cognitive and sensory experience. So I know there are nouns, or I can get the idea that there are nouns because there's stuff in the world and I interact with the stuff. And I know that um, there are verbs because I see objects impacting one another and I know I can do things to objects, and so I get the idea that there are verbs. So, in these, in these two cases, what, what make language similar in the first case is that we all human beings have the same built-in stuff, all this hardwired stuff. 
And in the second case, the similarities across languages are because we are all walking around with more or less the same bodies. We have more or less the same experience, the more or less the same perceptions. So the first one puts limits on linguistic structure because the limits are built into the system. The second puts limits on linguistic structure. Um, and we know there are limits because our languages don't vary in crazy infinite ways. They vary a lot, but they're not just random, they're randomly uh, varied. Um, so it, 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 we know that there are limits on these languages, and the limits matter because we want to know how learnable one language is for an, how learnable languages are. And we know that any human being can learn any Earth language, but the question is, if you get something that springs from some other system, be it physiologically in, in, implanted like the, like, the, like the universal grammar idea, or cognitively developed from our experience, um, could you learn that language? Do you have the stuff? Do you have the, and I don't mean necessarily smarts, I mean, do you have the equipment that's necessary? I'm just gonna go to the next one there. Thank you. Um, and so the question is then, okay, so we set aside phonetics. We're not gonna worry about how to go slurk and blurb and bubble or whatever, whatever the, whatever the, the medium is, we're not gonna ask about that, right? right? At this point, it could be a language based on anything. We have hundreds of languages. Uh, on Earth that are, that are signed we, and the rest are spoken. But if we have different bodies, we could do different things, right? So we're not going to worry about that. Our phonetics can, we'll do xenophonetics some other day. We don't need to worry about that now. The question is, could we learn the language structure? Could we really learn to either speak or understand um, a language like this? And, the, and I set out sort of the possibilities for you. So if, if both of the languages come from if we, uh, some kind of innate genetic place, or if both are culturally mediated, if the genesis is cultural, if the genesis is physiological, or if, there, if there's a mismatch, if humans turn out to have this physiological language unit and um, the ET language tends, would be cognitive, I mean, could we, could we make that crossover? Or the opposite, if it turns out that the human language is cognitively based and the other language is physiological, it comes from this universal grammar thing. Um, would those yield different systems? Well, we don't know, because we don't know where languages came from on Earth, really. And of course, the, and you have to leave the door open to other combinations or half combinations, like some of it's innate, all of it, a little bit less than we think, a little bit more than we think. Um, uh, and and the, the unfortunate thing, and the thing that makes me sad about this whole about this whole enterprise is it need not be reciprocal. So it might, and it might depend on crap factors that we don't know anything about. So it could be the case that we could learn their language, but they could not learn ours. Or it could be the other way around. In both of those cases, I just think, just make me sad to think about the possibility of not being able to be reciprocal. But, but I, think, I think if you're tearing structures down in order to understand what you have, which is my goal, my job as a linguist, is to look not just at what language is now, what I think about it, but to, to sort of deconstruct the whole thing so we can look at, in a realistic way about what the heck language is in the first place. So if you click the next one there for me. Thank you. Um, so then we have to ask, just like biologists want to know about the genesis of life on Earth, so is there a, a monogenesis of, of, of life, or did, it, did life arise on Earth in a number of different places? Because that gives us a sense of how common life is, right? So what, another question that we could ask is, how many times did language arise on Earth? And unfortunately, here are my, here are my guesses, which range about as wildly as they could possibly range, um, because we, we don't know. So, how many times did language begin on Earth? Well, here are the logical possibilities. We've got 7,000 signed and spoken languages that are alive on Earth today. Maybe there was even more before, but 7,000 is my number, roughly, that I have. So it could be that language began 7,000 different times, and that's, that's, that's the ridiculous large end. Um, because everybody knows the, the sort of the basic linguistic stuff about how French and Spanish and, uh, you know, Italian and Sardinian and all those guys came from Latin and that goes back a little ways and that goes back a little ways. So it's pretty clear that each language didn't get to have its own genesis, which is, which is um, well, that's just, we're, we know that. We could say maybe there was 350 different um, times when language arose, maybe one for each head of each language family and uh, there's 130 or so languages that are isolates, meaning we don't know what language family they're in. So if we can't, it could be that every time linguists can't 
figure out um, that two languages relate to one another. Maybe they were separately. Um, maybe there's a separate genesis for those two languages, which seems like a lot of hubris to me just because I can't figure out that they're related to declare that they're not. So I doubt this number. I'm doubting all my numbers, which I guess is sort of good. If you have numbers, you might as well doubt them. Um, so uh, it could be some smaller number reflecting uh, maybe some connections we don't know or um, different genesis for signed versus, or, um, versus spoken languages. That's possible. Um, or it could be, ta-da, at the other end of this, uh, the continuum, of course, that all of the languages of the world descended from proto-world, uh, you know, somewhere tens of thousands of years ago. You click the next one for me. Thank you. Okay, and why don't I know? <laughs> it, seems like, it seems like when I give one of these presentations or when I start talking about this stuff in class, I feel like I know less and less and less as time goes on. And as I learn more and more, I know less and less. Um, so here's the reason I don't know. At least I have a reason that I don't know. And my problem is time depth. So individual languages are changing all the time. Um, what, what we think of as language today will not be the same tomorrow. We don't know um, how language is going to change in what direction, but they do. They're changing all the time. So uh, there's nothing, and those of you who, um, who want to be purists and speak the perfect English, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to change your mind about what perfect English is in 20 years because it's going to change out from under you. So, uh, so if we take English as an ordinary example, um, within a sing single generation, there's like some change, right? And then, but, you, but it doesn't really affect understanding a lot. It does a little bit in my house. I have teenagers. Um, but honestly, you still kind of know, what, if you are 90, you still kind of know what the 10-year-olds are saying, um, even though you might sigh over individual words or individual twists of grammar, you still know what they're saying. So if you, take, if you go back about 700, uh, if you go back some time in the past, you begin to see some changes, okay? Um, so in Shakespeare's time, we, we had some changes uh, in, in grammar, so we're back 400 years or so. It's, you know, you have to look up a word or two, but you can still sort of get it. Within 700 years, we're going back to the Middle English. Um, what I have here is a, one of the, the Lord's Prayer is, one, is a very frequently copied piece of text, so we have lots of records of it going back quite a ways. And if you sort of know what the thing is saying here, um, the Middle English Lord's Prayer there, you can sort of get it. You can sort of see the word kingdom, and you can sort of see the word will, and you can sort of work out heaven, and you kind of know what's going on. But when you get back to Old English 1,200 years ago, um, the forms, it, they're, they're almost entirely different, right? We've almost, it's almost opaque. And you can see, especially since you've just seen the Middle English, you can kind of deduce that this is the same text. Um, you see Nama in there, and you're kind of like, yeah, I sort of get that. There's become, there's some things that I recognize. But this is, this is another language. And if you're going to study Old English, you're studying a foreign language. So language change makes it really important that if we're ever going to establish any kind of dialogue, um, which we may or may not do. But if there's any chance that we will ever exchange messages, we have to know and keep track in some systemic way of what we said. So about every 75 years or so, we ought to be looking at the message we sent and saying, OK, we still understand this, but this word has changed its meaning. And so I want to update and document um, what this message said so that if we ever get a response, we don't go, wait, what, is we say? wait, what is that? What did we say? And then have to look back and not understand ourselves which would be profoundly um, embarrassing in some kind of interstellar way. So we also have to understand that the message that we get, if we're getting a message, it doesn't matter, but we have to understand that that message is no longer, um, no longer maps on a, in a one-to-one -one way with what the person, what the, what the ET language is like now. So we're getting their language, it's a time shift, right? We're getting their language as it was spoken when they sent it, not as it is now. And it might not be a problem, but again, if we're, if we're writing back and we're like, oh, cool, we understand, we're going to send, we send a message and we're speaking their uh, old English to them, right? So at least we can do is keep track. Um, we just click to the next one. So what we know about old English, what we know about all these things comes obviously from written records. We don't, I don't yet have my time machine that I've been requesting. Um, and we assume, 
so everything I know, everything I know about language change and Old English comes from written records, which is great. But we can't necessarily assume that literacy co-occurs with language. So you could, um, you could have technology, you could have, as, as soon as you get to the place where you can record speech in some kind of way, whatever your medium is, then you don't necessarily need writing anymore. Uh, um, there, are plenty, uh, there are plenty of people, for example, who lose their vision later in life who never learn to read again. They never learn to read Braille because they just listen to texts that are spoken. Um, and you, you, you know, one can argue that that comes from texts that were written down, but it wouldn't have to be that way. So it feels natural to me um, that one of the developments linguistically that, that, a, that a culture would have would be that they would develop writing. But it's not necessarily the case. And we can't assume that just because we did it with our great big n equals 1 sample, um, we can't assume that because we did it that that's the way it has to be done. So um, you could go around and invent all kinds of technology and fail to develop writing, or you could, or your culture could decide at some point that you don't need writing anymore, which means that signals that we get may contain the equivalent of visual or audio recordings. And I don't know, and I, I'm not again, we're not talking about phonetics here, so I don't know what medium it would be, um, which would mean that uh, that our that the signal would have more variation in it than we might expect if we were getting written texts. Every time you utter a word, it is slightly different. It's really difficult physiologically to produce exactly the same acoustic signal two times in a row. Um, so the, the words that, the recording, the digital, um, the digital reflection, the digital uh, recording of a word looks different every time you see it. That's why it's really, really hard to read spectrograms. You can't look at a spectrogram and tell me exactly what it's saying without a lot of computer intervention, right? It can be done, um, but it's because we already know what it's going to say that we can do that. We already know what, what English is like. So um, to avoid teaching ET to read, along with teaching everything else, we might consider encoding um, the real deal instead of writing. Encoding, along with the written forms, encoding something, uh, encoding the recordings of the, of the words. OK, let's see. Um, so I want to go to the next one. I want to look at then um, some things that languages do on Earth. Uh, so that we can so that we can systematically try to ignore these if we're looking at a new signal, right? Um, and I won't go through this whole list because I got excited and I made a great big list. Um, <laughs> but some of the things that are worth looking at in terms of breaking into the code and getting access, if we if we did have a written um, if we did have a written signal, so we've got somewhere between 12 and 100 consonants and vowels, um, which are the building blocks of spoken language. There's some kind of reasonable re level of redundancy grammatically, although it is not always the case that the most important material is repeated. The most important things I say in a sentence are generally the big content words, the nouns and the verbs, and I don't say my verbs twice. I might refer back to them in some kind of recoverable way, but it's not, generally, it's not the most important stuff that's repeated even though I just repeated that sentence, I don't know. Um, but in a, in, a, in a discourse, you can recover more redundancy, um, but you can't necessarily count on the point being, um, being made clear several times in a row. Um, so we, can, uh, we have different words, maybe 10,000 to 100,000 of them, depending on what you think a word is. Um, we have an arbitrary link between a word and what it signifies, so uh, you don't know what glurk means until I point out to you what glurk means, which is one of the big problems in understanding a signal with no, with no reference, right? How do you, you can decode a pattern, but can you ever really know what they're saying um, if the signals are arbitrary? Um, let's see. So we can, we can make new words. We can create new utterances. That's what makes language useful. There are some things that we mark. We generally mark numbers. We gener as in uh, how many, singular or plural. We generally uh, mark the tense when the thing happened. Um, we have uh, ways of encoding how words interact with one another in sentence. Our greetings are largely phatic, meaning that they're largely um, content-free. They're kind of just they're just an attention getter, which is a lot of what we um, are thinking about when we're thinking about sending a signal. Is we're thinking about well, the first bit is just going to be a hi, we're here kind of thing, and um, maybe that's not what's expected. Um, let's see, and we can do all kinds of things like ask questions that we assume are necessary. Okay. 
Let me flip to the next one there. Okay. Um, I think I'm starting to get a little bit short on time, so I'm going to skip some of these too. But some things that lang some languages do that not lots of languages do. There are some languages, instead of saying left and right of you, they say east and west of you. They're always keeping track of the language. To speak the language properly, you always have to know where north is, which is, which is kind of cool. Um, and there are languages where things that we think of are of separate, as separate, like, uh, like texture and color, are conflated into single words. We have some of those. Um, and uh, putting the direct object first is really rare in languages of the world. So pop to the next one. Um, here are some things languages don't do, but we could. Um, it's just sort of a list of things, ways you could label nouns with, you know, everything from do you like it, does it smell good, does it have teeth. You could, you could put any kinds of markers on nouns that you want. You could use different verbs on different days of the week. You could have entirely different syntax. Uh, for quotations or for good news or bad news. You can make more fine divisions in time. Um, you could, all my, all my students like this one, when they're doing created language and stuff, you could write and speak a word backward to mean it's opposite. No language does that. It's kind of a crazy idea, but it's possible. Um, um, and almost anything you can think up, you could probably do in a language because you can think it up, right? We don't know, uh, but some of those things just certainly aren't done. And if you go to the next slide, here are some things that languages could do, but we can't manage it. Cognitively, we cannot, we cannot do these things. We've had a little bit of experimental evidence on what's learnable and what's not learnable. So this one always sort of hurts my head, the severe, I call it severe center embedding. So we can do things like, if you have these sentences, the cheese was rotten, uh, the cat chased the rat, and the dog hated the cat, you can start doing things like, what was rotten? Uh, the what was rotten? Well, the, the cheese was rotten. Okay, so the cheese the rat ate was rotten. And you can, keep, you can keep going down these sentences, embedding more and more. So if we get the, the rat, the cat, chased, oh man, and, I, and they, they get really hard to read, right? Um, the rat, the cat, chased, ate the cheese, which is fine. And then you get down to the cat, the dog, hated, chased the rat, which is still fine. But by the time you get all the way down to the end and you've embedded all these things, um, you get something that's almost totally unreadable. The cheese, the rat, the cat, the dog, hated, chased, ate, was rotten. I can't even make that sentence in my in proper intonation, right? So. Um, it's, it's possible, it's logically possible, but it's not cognitively possible due to constraints on probably on our short-term memory. That's probably why we can't do that. Um, we, have a, we can't do some kind of crazy check sum at the ends of our sentences to count up the number of segments or the number of verbs or the number of this or the number of that. Um, we can't do information flow on more than two channels. So everyone, people like to talk about how uh, well, visuals are 90% of the communication system. Um, they add to it, but we can't keep track of all that um, information necessarily. And if you strip out some of the visuals, you still get the point. Um, let's see. Um, and we don't do dramatically increase. We, we can't survive with a language that says everything 55 times, right? We have a level of redundancy that we can deal with and a level of redundancy that's, that's above us and beyond us. Okay, so finally we have my list of conclusions here. Um, so the, the, mostly what I have to say for conclusions is trying really to dramatically unthink everything we think we know about language, everything that we assume we know about language, and everything that we learn about language, so that in case one of those variables that we have constructed our language with it doesn't work, in case there's something um, that the alien languages do that ours don't, we, we won't be um, completely flummoxed by it. So, um, so language, and I, I don't think I've talked much about this, but we can't necessarily assume that language co-occurs with intelligence. We've got a sample of one. Um, you know, we're intelligent, we have language, so what does that mean? Well, it means we're intelligent and we have language. It doesn't mean necessarily that that is a necessary co-occurrence in the universe. Writing does not necessarily co-occur with language. Um, it took us a while to develop writing on our own, and it's not necessarily the case, again, that other systems, other, other species would do this. It's great that we have it. It did happen for us. Writing um, did emerge a couple times we, uh, uh, on Earth 
um, separately, so we know that it can happen, and it can happen more than once, but it might not appear in, a alien, uh, in an alien language, and we can't necessarily assume that it did. We may have like n equals two or three or four in this case, but still we don't have n equals enough. Um, so again, the time depth involved in sending messages, uh, inter, inter, uh, interstellar messages, probably means that we should keep track of what it is we said, and not only what it is we said, but what it is we, we meant. So um, I would say that if we're making a time capsule, we should open it up every 100 years and look at the stuff in there and go, yeah, we still know what that is, and then close it up. It's dramatic and, and I think really romantic to allow yourself to be surprised by your time capsule in you know, 3,000 years, but um, I don't think, I like surprises, but I prefer to know what the heck's going on. So, so it makes good sense to me to, to open the, your time capsules back up every 100 years or so and look in there and see what's there and make sure that it still makes sense to you. Um, languages might include linguistically impossible things, um, and what is possible for one language might not be possible for another, and not just in the language possible, but in your mind possible, would you be able to speak it? Um, thinking outside the box might be a lot harder than we think it is. Um, let, me, let me arrow down in my own notes here. So, um, and, and ET language may or may not be learnable, and that learnability may or may not be reciprocal. Again, that's the part that makes me really sad because I want to learn it, and I want it to be possible for me to learn it. And it might be the case that our computers could learn it, but we could not. And in that, and I'm quite certain we need a computer to do the initial decoding, but once it's decoded, could I manage to get that language into my mind and use it? I don't know. Um, we, the rhetorical structure of our, our, our understanding of rhetorical structure might not match, such that a greeting at the beginning of a message might not make any sense. It might be the wrong thing to do. Maybe you're supposed to present your conclusions first. I don't know. Um, so we also have some linguistic redundancy, but we need to make sure that we know that not everything is redundant in a way that makes sense to us. So I think the summary for me, uh, the take home for me, is that we don't know. There's more we don't knows than we knows, and we have an N of one, probably. Um, and so we can't make too many assumptions with too much comfort about what other languages would be like. OK, thanks. Thank you, Doug. Did I wander away? I'm sorry. Questions? <laughs> Um, I'm going to take, um, I'm going to question your N of one for language and intelligence because as we become smart enough to begin th <clears throat> pulling apart non-human communication, some of it seems to have syntax and so you could call that communication a language and I, I, I'm really loath to say that human language and intelligence is the only example that we have of an intelligence with language. I hope so. I really hope so. I think that, um, and, and I'm, I'm cautious enough to want to know before I say so, right? But I hope that you're right. And I think in, in linguistics historically, there was a lot of, a lot of energy was spent on ensuring ourselves that, oh, please, we are the only ones with language. Those animals, no, that's just, some kind of communication. I'm not on that boat. I really hope that we do find um, that both it's sophisticated enough that we would call it a language and that it's learnable. Because I think, again, um, would it be learnable? I don't know. And maybe that's why we don't know if it's a language yet or not. Um, because it, maybe it's not learnable. I don't know. C could, I, could I follow that up? Uh, so what, what historically have linguists po pointed to in language that seems specific to humans and not found in other animal communications? You know, unfortunately, there's been something of a scramble to keep language out of the hands of animals. Um, sort, of, sort of linguistically, and it is embarrassing to me as a linguist to say this, but there, there, there is um, things like uh, displacement. Can you talk about things that aren't there? Um, there's things about duality of patterning. Do you have one kind of something akin to consonants and vowels that build words, that build phrases. And I don't know that that's necessary for a language, but it's one of the things that, that we certainly use. Um, and, and people have continually updated the design features of language specifically in some cases to make sure that, you know, dolphins don't get it.
So as soon as non-human animals have the capacity, it's no longer a feature of language. That's right. Okay. We, we skittle away from it, right? Got it. But, but I think that if you've got a communication system that's complex and that, you can, that, and that is productive, I think for me, the, the, for me the two keys would be that the language is productive, meaning you can make up new words and you can make novel utterances, and that you can talk about things that aren't there. Um, those seem to me to be the most important things. And we, we see the rudiments of displacement, of talking about things of not there and things like alarm calls, right? Where one animal will see a thing, see a hawk coming down, right? And, and, it, and give the hawk cry. And the other animals who have not seen the hawk will go hide. So that to me is displacement. Um, they're not talking about the hawk that they saw last Tuesday, as far as I know, but when they do, I'm ready. I'm ready to call that a language. Or, or as an example of a novel word, a, a couple of weeks ago we had a workshop at the SETI Institute on non-human communication. Uh, one of the researchers specialized in gibbon research and pointed out that there's a certain group of gibbons in Wisconsin who have created a name for the Goodyear blimp that flies over on football weekends. So. Well, and we know that Alex the parrot did that, right? Alex made up some words. Um, that, and th and there, there again is, um, I mean, that wasn't, the goal of that research was, um, was cognition, not linguistic, but when, when Alex the parrot started making up, um, started combining words to make new words, that got my attention in a really uh, bright and exciting way. Alex was a, a, an interesting case. I, I invited uh, Irene Pepperberg at Ecole Normale Supérieure a couple of years ago as a visiting professor, and she was uh, very disturbed because of the problem she could have with her parrot uh, coming in Paris for uh, one month. Because the link between uh, Alex and, and Irene was very strong, and I proposed to the director of the Ecole Normale Supérieure to create a, a post of visiting animal, which she didn't do, but I uh, thought it was a mistake. Um, about, uh, I, I have a, a number of questions about uh, your, your fascinating talk, only, only one here. Um, in, the, in, the, in the features of language you have, uh, you have given, you have only given uh, positive features of what uh, language can do. You have not spoken about uh, lying or harassment and stuff like that. Oh, I would just call that all displacement. We get to lie and harass and be mean. Um. Uh, it's, I, think that's, I think that's a quality of being able to talk about things that aren't there and a quality of novel utterances. But you're right, I did try to make it nice. Other question? Uh, Tomislav? Uh, you talked about language changes and you said that we don't have much difficulties in uh, understanding all languages because we can figure out the grammar changes. Uh, do you think that uh, conceptual changes play some role too in uh, trying to figure out what they really meant when they wrote something? Oh, that's, that's quite possible. And I mean, and I also don't mean to, to, to give the idea that all languages is learnable easily. It would take me a really long time as a native English speaker to learn Navajo, for example. It's doable. Um, but, it, but because of the structure of, of English, I would have more trouble moving to Navajo than I would have trouble moving to French, for example. And, and yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know how to, I don't, that's a really good question. I don't know how to measure changes in conceptual thinking over time, but I really would love to. And part of the problem is that we don't have enough ex extent language samples from very far back in time, right? And the things that we have from, uh, that are very old texts have A, been recopied many times, and B, were sort of carefully thought out. It's not like we write now where it's like, right, 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 send. Um, very carefully thought out because the process was quite laborious and not everybody could write. So it's a whole different, very carefully chosen set. And I'm grateful to have them all. I love them all. But it's a very carefully chosen and perhaps um, not representative set of language. Uh, Sherry, I, I just want your take on something. I mean, people at a party will occasionally ask, you know, what would you send to the aliens? And aside from sending the Google servers, I say I would send a picture dictionary, you know, just a bunch of pictures of a planet and that sort of things that you can possibly assume that they would recognize. And then underneath you have the word for it in whatever language. 
right? So you send them a bunch of nouns, essentially, and maybe you could contrive with stick figures or things to send them a bunch of verbs. If you did those two things, are there enough uh, commonalities in all forms of communication, what you call languages, that you'd have some reasonable certainty they would figure anything out? I think so, but, but I wouldn't send pictures. I don't know what I would send. It's, I'm, just, I'm just here to throw things away, not really to build anything useful, I guess. Um, because, uh, so pictures might not be the thing. So, so for example, if you, have a, if you have a race of beings that dealt without electromagnetics, right? If you've got like a, I don't mean uh, technologically, but if they're all blind aliens. So blind aliens, you'd be like, what in the heck is this two-dimensional thing that I don't even know? They seem to be doing variants in something. And um, I, as a reasonably intelligent person, have a lot of trouble going from 2D to 3D in my head. So I don't, and that's a, that's a transformation that you get to do because you have stereoscopic vision and you have vision, right? So, so I, don't, I don't know that I want a picture dictionary, but throwing that kibitz aside for a minute, um, I do think that a series of some kind of representation of nouns might work. So for example, if I, what I thought about doing for my talk was a monolingual field methods demo where I get an object and then I get a person who speaks a language I don't know to give me the name for that object and then I get two of the objects and I hold them up and then I get them to say the word pluralized and then theoretically I know how to make plurals. And in about 20 minutes doing that kind of thing, you can build up two sentences like, I give you the whatever it is, the cup. So I think that it is possible if you share, if you're willing to agree that you share certain assumptions, but you've got to really get those assumptions down. Um, one time I was doing a field methods demo with someone who I hadn't really gone through it with beforehand, and I pointed to the cup and I you know, held it up and, and I found out later she said, do you really want to drink that? It's empty. I'm like, no. So, so, so she didn't agree, she did not share my presupposition that what she was supposed to do is name the object, right? So um, there's, there is a basic set of, I would call them Gricean, the basic set of cooperative principles that go into language learning that we talk about as English as a second language instructors, right? I go into my class and I know that we share certain, um, we share a certain uh, set of rules for the things that I'm going to do with you because you don't speak my language. We understand that we're teaching language. I understand that you're trying to learn the language. You understand that if I point to something or hold it in my hand and make a noise that that's the name for the object. It's really, um, that's one of the reasons why some folks want there to be something innate about noun learning. Um, and others say, she's pointing to it, duh. Of course she means that's the name for it. So yes, I think so. And I think you could build up to quite complex things once you get the hook, once you figure out, oh, that's what we're doing. You're giving me the names of things. I get it. One of the things you said was, uh, I, I don't remember the adjective, uh, that you were disturbed or disappointed about the, the lack of reciprocity uh, of language learning. Uh, it seems to me that this has implications for SETI search strategies. So typically we've assumed that the more uh, advanced extraterrestrials or the older extraterrestrials will um, be able to understand us more easily than, than we could understand them or that, that they would be more capable of understanding language. But I think your sense was it's hard to predict who would be able to understand who. Yeah, I mean, I don't understand squirrels. I don't even know if they have language, right? right. So, so if I get a signal, do I even, like, what are they doing? And I think it's really easy to lose track of your history um, if you're not careful. So if we got a message in Old English, I mean, said he would have to call up an Old English scholar. I mean, it would be the, the equivalent for them, right? I gotta, this I, would be great in academia, right, for, for uh, <laughs> I know job several, security. I know several people who would be just delighted, yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but I think that the, the, the assumption, we're making more assumptions, right, that A, um, their language, that language uh, stopped, continues to develop, which it may or may not. Maybe we've got it. Maybe this is how, it, maybe this is how language does. Maybe we're about done. Because we don't seem to be making in the last... Um, thousand years anything more complicated linguistically. We just seem to be changing around the bits. Um, so maybe it doesn't get much more complicated than this in the next thousand or two thousand years. But we sure as heck don't remember what it is we used to do. 
And we're absolutely no good, like, like Jill said at the, at the beginning, right, the question, we're, we're absolutely no good at figuring out what other species on our planet are doing, and they come from us, right? I mean, they're, they're from us, but they're, they're, they're our, our, they share the same environment um, in some cases. Uh, and so I, I wouldn't want to assume that their language is less sophisticated, therefore we should be able to understand it, but we're bad at it, and we haven't done it yet. So, and I don't know that they would remember, what's it, what, what was it like? What was it like when, what was it like 200,000 years ago on Earth and could I talk to those people? I don't know. Sherry, it's Jill again. Um, but I think the discussion that we've been having um, and Doug's question about the older civilization, it's as if this is the only time it's ever happened one-on-one. -on -one. Right. Oh, and yeah. the point is, an older civilization has probably gone through this process multiple times. Um, that is, if n is at anywhere north of one. I mean, if there are a number of civilizations in the galaxy. And as we look at non-human languages, we're actually getting better at it as we begin to understand that there is non-human communication. And as we try one and then we recognize that there's actually another kind of communication with another animal. It's, mm -hmm. it's the, the fact that more than one example so is the, helping. So that they have, then they would have more experience. Yeah, that, that I would hope be. So. I hope so. So there'd like be a department of, you know, primitive language interpretation or whatever. Um, and I, I would hope, and then, but of course I don't know, but I, I hope that you're right. So they would, they would really have a department of xenolinguistics? They would. Okay, okay. Lucky uh, them. Uh, I'll ask people to hold any other questions until break, and uh, let's thank Sherry again. Thank you.